Trader Merlin Show. It is your Tuesday edition. Hope you had a great day out there. In tune with the old power trading radio format, we'll do Tuesday as Forex. Today we're going to talk a lot about the Forex markets. And yes, I saw some comments going, weakness in the Euro. Yes, we'll talk about the weakness in the Euro. And of course, go into whatever listener questions you guys have. Feel free to send those on in. We've got a great guest today who uh, you guys are know is no stranger to the program. He puts out tons and tons of content on a regular basis, which we'll talk to you about here in a little bit. But today's topic is going to be short everything Euro. Yes, we see the, a picture of Walker there with a baseball bat just crushing the Euro. Who knows? Obviously, it's just opinion based out here, but we'll get some food for thought on why this might be a, an ugly point for the Euro. Joining me today, we've got Mr. Walker, Texas trader, England. Walker, how you doing? Merlin, hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Always a pleasure having you on. I, 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 I try to bring you guys on in a one month rotation. It's been a few more than that, so hopefully we'll get you back on more frequently. What have you been up to? Oh, trying to uh, stay busy in, in 2021, and the market has lots of opportunity between the uh, big run in equities, Forex finally breaking out. There, There's just so much. It's You just got to get out there and put your hands on it. Love it. I'm loving it. Um, you know, when we talked earlier about what might be a nice topic for today, you, you just said, Short Euro, short Euro. And it's funny because when I talk to somebody like David Warner, he's going, long pound, long pound. So walk me through your synopsis on you know why you think the Euro is, is headed for some trouble here. You guys might have seen in the write-up, I said, you know, the Euro has been showing some weakness for uh, a few weeks now. And some um, I think Drew was like, what? Weakness? Well, if you look at this chart here, really all of January was a down month for the Euro. That's technically four weeks. So... Um, not saying it's the end of the road, but Walker, why do you think it's going to be, uh, why short the Euro here? Well, a lot like the, the image, grab the baseball bat because the ECB has just set this one up on a tee for you. Uh, to be quite frank, uh, last time the ECB met, they, they flat out said that the Euro at its current levels was hindering the recovery post C-19 crisis. So, you flat out have the ECB saying the euro is too high. Yeah. And as we know, the first rule of Forex trading, as the central bank goes, so so does price action. So you can't discount that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because we've seen uh, telegraph punches like this from Australia as well when they're like, hey, we, we need to get our currency much lower. And um, they were pretty much saying, here's this level, and it would just gravitate right towards it and right to it. At least with Australia, they were saying numbers. Here you had some, it was somewhat vague and saying, you know, it, the currency at these levels are hindering. What what do you think that their next step is? Because obviously this next ECB meeting, they'll, they'll probably start to telegraph that punch a little bit. And, and what can they do to push that euro down? Well, there's several things that they, they can do. The, the first one is obviously going the uh, Swiss franc route and, and going into negative interest rates. <laughs> and there's been analysts and economists inside of the ECB that aren't afraid to say that they are projecting towards negative interest rates, which leads to the euro going down. And if that's not enough, you just have to think about how much money is going to be dumped in the eurozone to, to try to re-stimulate the economy, much like we're doing here in the United States. Those things alone between stimulus and negative rates are, are definitely a uh, method that they could take the euro down and quite quickly. Yeah, you know, um, when we look at that euro, and I, I kind of want to, we can dovetail into this. I, I, I'm with you. I echo your sentiment on EURUSD. So I was looking at that. Uh, oops bring up that currency pair again you know you have this slow little rollover and for the most part i think everyone in this audience who's a trend follower would understand yeah the trend is your friend till the bend at the end and and granted this euro dollar chart going back into mid last year early last year yes it is on an uptrend it's making higher highs and higher lows but what's noteworthy for me is what really started happening in december because from December to the uh, to January 1st, it was still continuing this uptrend, but we had a long candle down, which broke a previous low. Now, now that's not alarming. It's just one of those things that, okay, it's now starting to make a new low. What's noteworthy for me, though, is following that, it started to fail to make higher highs, right? It's, it, it's no longer making higher highs for the better part of a month, and all of a sudden it's making new lows. This may be that moment where we spot that trend at the end. I had a listener ask me about a head and shoulders pattern on the Euro USD. Do those things factor into your your thought process here? Absolutely. And I'm big into historical trading. And for those that are saying that we're still in an uptrend, I get it. 
2020, we saw a, what, nearly a 10% increase in value of the euro against the buck. And it's the biggest run-up that we've had since 2017. Here's the thing. The higher things go, the harder they typically fall. And uh, case in point, right, just look at uh, GameStop stock. So this big increase, while, while I get the trend is up, and I'm not going to fight you over it, we are starting to see those series of technical levels fold over, which are, to me, indicative of a potential turn. Yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, obviously, if you're trading that EURUSD, you know, we mentioned that little... Um, a head and shoulders pattern there you know this is going to be the exact opposite if we look at that Dixie and as some of you already mentioned the dollar index out there here's that Dixie which you know we've been talking on this program I think most people in this group would agree that we've been bearish for this for quite some time and all of a sudden it has started to stabilize now not saying that the dollar is out of the woods yet but it is making a higher low and a higher high right now so this may be that turning point um, what's your take on the dollar having a rebound from these levels I, I personally like it, and I may actually uh, just steal the screen from you real yeah. quick. Share anytime let's, you let's like. Let's go ahead and take a look at the dollar index. There we go. And I think I've got that up now. Yep. We should be seeing the Dixie. You got it. What we have is a series of reversal patterns all kind of glued together. And the first thing that gets me is this big, sharp descending wedge. And this is the big drop off into the, the end of the year. And we've broken out from that wedge. And for me, that's the first sign. And again, I'm not saying that we're gonna come back up to highs, but that's the first sign that the selling pressure has been relieved. Now, take that as you will, but when you're talking head and shoulders patterns, you actually have the inverse head and shoulders pattern on this graph, similar to what you have and the euro dollar and we are just starting to break out over the neckline here today mm -hmm. so if we start to have a continued rally over this 9150 level again not calling an all-out reversal but I, I definitely think that uh, 93 plus could be in the cards for the DXY yeah you know it's interesting uh, did me a favor so zoom out a little bit oh you keep goes you can stay there Stay on your chart. Uh, this is a great comment from Drew, and he I think he's absolutely right. So Drew says, you know, what about what was seen in August uh, through December? And so if you go just zoom out a little bit, yep. you'll notice almost the exact same picture. Yeah, right. See that we, we were making higher, uh, lower lows, lower low, uh, highs, and then we mm -hmm. reversed. And, and that little spike out we saw just about the end of September, to me is very similar to what we have right now. And we never know for certain, guys, if, if this move up, is the, the all-out reversal and boom, we next thing you see 100 on the dollar or if it's just uh, a short-term rally that ends up failing like the one did back in October. And the point is here, I don't think that, or at least I'm not saying, hey, the dollar is out of the woods, it's glory days, load the freaking boat and buy everything you can. I'm just saying that it's showing signs of strength. And, and if I was to buy the dollar now, whatever, let's call it 91.50, um, when it breaks 91.50, then I'm not going all in. I'm buying some, and if that trend starts to build and continue, then I would be adding to that position. Uh, obviously, what happened back in September, you know, I think it just the, the move failed, right? We, you have the printing from the Fed and, and pushing this dollar down. You've got a lot of forces at play right here that are affecting this dollar. Yes, and I take a firm approach. Let let the chart prove me wrong. And right now, all we have is a thesis that the dollar is starting to to gain strength. I'm going to follow that until the chart absolutely proves me wrong. Right. And the good thing about it, too, and remember the baseball bat, short, short everything, Euro. If you're worried about dollar and you're worried that the, the dollar strength or weakness may not be the trend, always pair the Euro against something else. So if you're worried about the dollar strength or dollar weakness, just go to something else. And I think it's kind of funny that you mentioned my, my friend and colleague, David Warner talking about pound strength. Yep. What if you marry a weak euro against a strong pound? One of the currencies I'm really focusing on for the next coming months is going to be the, the euro pound short. And this had a nice head and shoulders pattern as well. And we're actually just cracking through the neckline now, 
And if you marry those two together, uh, 8450 is, is a uh, projection of mine for, for this specific pair. I like it. I like what's what was interesting there is you've taken David's optimism on the British pound. He thinks that's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Your pessimism on the euro because you think it's getting weaker. You marry those two, and, and I think you know from a relative strength perspective, you're expecting to see a much bigger move down in the euro British pound. Yes, absolutely, and you you completely get the dollar out of the equation. Yeah. So you could just forget about that mess and and trade a cleaner chart. And it's not just the euro pound. You, you can really pick your own cross pair here. The the euro can, to me, looks uh, like a nice downward sloping trend. So you can look to trade this descending channel here. Uh, the euro kiwi also looking very bearish. So you can trade that on breakouts. And even with the uh, dovish RBA last night, the Euro Aussie short could be a, a opportunity as well. So pick your Euro chart. It, it's definitely leaning to the downside, in my opinion. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I, you know, and again, like as Drew pointed out in the, in the chat here, you know, you, you have to approach these things with with a little bit of pessimism, but I mean, trust sure. the price chart and, and stay with what you see on the charts until you're proven wrong. Um, if you're a long term investor and you look at the giant picture, then yeah. You know, stay long on that euro. But if you're looking at the shorter term trends possibly reversing and affecting the bigger picture, you know, I think you go to the short side here. And I think there's plenty of opportunity out there. Um, answer me or, or, or riddle me this. If we look at um, the the dollar index, and this is sure. a question that's come through from a few people. Medic says, you know, what about the stimulus and raising minimum wage to 15 bucks? Shouldn't that tank the dollar? I'm of the belief that we already have so much priced in to the US dollar with regards to printing more, right? It's not like we've just started talking about a stimulus package. This has been going on for months now. Mm -hmm. They just can't get their act together. And you know, if you go back and, and look at that dollar chart, I, I think that the weakness in the dollar is reflecting the, the certainty that there's going to be some stimulus package coming out and you know, how it's laid out or who it benefits is, is the you know $50 billion question. But at a certain point, you know, the, the pessimism on the U.S. dollar that sell-off should subside because just because of the stimulus doesn't mean it goes down forever. It just goes down to a certain point. I agree with you 100 percent. And the way I look at it this way is the stimulus is priced in. We're to the point where the stimulus has gone from billions with a B to trillions with a T eventually what's going to happen is first you're going to get numb to the stimulus and it's not going to have the same effect but second what happens when you do start slowly taking that stimulus away or it's not as much as the market intended and we're already starting to see some pushback with uh, some of these programs i want to go into politics and congress enough about that but what happens when you pull the major driver away. So if the trend is down and you take the catalyst away, I, I think you could have the potential for a, a good rebound at present levels if that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and by the way, but for those who can't see it, this is a monthly time frame of that dollar index. And you know we've, we've addressed that 90 mark. It's kind of been holding, going back to those lows from 2017. Um, you know, those are levels that you, it's not just you and I looking at. This is big institutional money is focusing on as well. Now, l let me just play devil's advocate here. Let's say that the U.S. dollar continues to slide. The government completely screws up the faith in America, which <laughs> could happen. They screwed up my faith in it. Um, and it continues to drop. We get a break down below that 88 mark. And now you're into a territory where we don't really have much in the way of large-scale time frames from a demand perspective what you know, I'm, I'm kind of throwing a worst case scenario at you sure. you know if we break that 88 what, what's your thoughts on what happens to the dollar here is it is it straight shot to 80 or are you seeing intermediate stops no I, I think it goes parabolic to the downside at, wow. at that point because you're going to have to have some kind of outside catalyst and again when you're talking worst case scenario You've got to think worst case scenario, and that would be a driver down to 80 on the dollar index, and that's something we haven't seen since 2014. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, I, I think you've got to be holding on to commodities. Uh, again, gold, silver, or even some of the alt uh, options like crypto, uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, and Ethereum are, are probably doing very well in this alternate timeline where we see a dollar crash to, to 80 in my opinion. 
Yeah, is, is that where your target... I mean, are, are, I mean, there's a question that comes through here from Jerry. He says, does Walker think that the Dixie's going to head to 96 before it heads to 85? And I got another one asking me for a 94, but... Um, what you, do you see a bounce up to those levels, 94, 96, before we ultimately head down? I I like the rebound play, and okay. I, I think it's the theme with central banks right now. I, I think it's the theme with an international recovery, which brings the dollar back and erases some of those 2020 declines. So for me, if you tie my uh, arm behind my back and say pick a side, I'm, I'm definitely on, on the bullish side for now until proven otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm bullish on it just because that temporary base from back in 2017, 18 looks like it's holding, and and we're starting to make higher highs. So my bearishness on the dollar is is no longer there. I mean, I can switch real quick, but right now it feels like we're starting to move back up. The the level that was mentioned by Brendan said 94. Um, yeah, 94 is obviously a pretty big target, but there's one that for me in particular I'm focusing on, which is 92. The, yeah. the reason I'm focusing on the 92 mark is if you look at it on a daily or shorter term time frame, you know, you'll see that we're starting to get nice momentum up in that dollar index presently, certainly over the past few days. And we've broken above 91, which to me is a key mark. But there was a real aggressive sharp move down from 92 going all the way back into uh, the late November. Now, to me, that sharp aggressive move obviously can represent a pretty big imbalance in supply and demand here. I think that they'll, it'll be that retake, uh, that pause moment. We've broken above 91. We're starting to see some uptrend here. My guess is we'll have hesitation at 92. And if it doesn't come back and test the lows of uh, sub 90, then I think then you're going to be off to the races and move to the upside. Yes, and if you take the uh, extension of this head and shoulders pattern, it, it puts you right in that 92 to 92.25 area, and you can see the previous drop off. Mm -hmm. But yes, that that's the next major point of resistance, and I wouldn't be surprised if we had a battle around this 92 area mark. Mm -hmm. And if we had a little pause and a breather, then yes, it, it could be the next major headline that, that really sets the Dixie off. Yes. Uh, well, um, plenty of opportunity out there, guys. Either way you play it, I think you're seeing, from my perspective, a transition right now from that really aggressive, painful sell-off in the dollar. Of course, if you're an equity holder, you, you want to see a sell-off in the dollar, to a um, slight uptrend here. And, and uh, certainly this will be something we'll focus on in this show going forward. I normally don't quote the dollar index on our uh, when I do the market recap, but I might start doing it because I think it's becoming more of interest. Remember, as that dollar rises, that's going to put pressure on the equity markets to the south side um, that becomes means our goods are getting more and more expensive and that could choke off uh, trade and things like that of course that that could be a long time down the road before we really see the impact but that certainly is a slowing mechanism for the equity markets I, I guess the last take, Merlin, is don't forget that NFP is on Friday. Yep. And because we have so much interest at the dollar index at these key levels, expectations are positive, 65,000. We had a huge miss last month. So, again, Friday, don't be complacent, whether you're trading equities or trading Forex or even monitoring the futures market. Pay attention to the, the NFP headline because that could definitely give us uh, the directional bias that we need on some of these pairs. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of things there earlier, and I know you've done a couple of webinars on the crypto side of things. Uh, I'm curious to get your take. We're seeing what what appears to be more of a rotation and acceptance of those crypto assets. Certainly, Bitcoin. Bitcoin's actually been a little sluggish over the past week or so, but Ethereum uh, has just been soaring off the race is all-time highs today and congrats to all of us and, and those in the room who are holding ethereum but it's been really not just ethereum i mean most of the altcoins have been on significant rises is this an area that you're incorporating more into your trading or, and, and what's your thoughts on the crypto space for for me in crypto i'm, I'm not actively trading crypto day in and day out like I do crypt or currencies, but I do have uh, Ethereum in a ledger wallet, and it's just kind of more of a, a passive interest for me, mm -hmm. and it's also a hedge against those forces that we talked about earlier in the program. And I think, especially with the run-on supply of hard metals, people are going to turn to crypto as another mechanism for for safety and I, I completely think that's why we see ethereum at all-time highs today yeah yeah I, i'm like you i have them on ledgers it's funny because I'm, I'm trying to put more and maybe brennan i get you on the show one time because i know you've been uh, looking into this a lot more 
is the DeFi aspects. And and while I want to keep things on me, these ledgers and keep them out mm-hmm. of um, the reach of, of you know hackers, etc. I want to keep them in my own possession. I also want to keep them on exchanges and be getting interest on them. I mean, I, I'm really happy with my BlockFi account and just under. Uh, I started that account on December 8th and it already has over $300 in interest in it. Man, that, that's a far cry different than what I get from my savings or bank accounts. And I kind of want to do more of that, but a little nervous in the DeFi thing. So maybe Brandon, one day we'll get you on to talk about your DeFi experiences and, and what you trust out there. Um, all right. So tell me, Walker, a little bit about your what you're doing. I know I want to go to some other charts. If you guys have questions, feel free to send in whatever currency sure. you want to look at. Um, but you've got a lot of stuff going on right now with regards to education. I know if you go to, I think I, I had it up there. I may I'll put your name on the screen. There you go. Uh, if you email Walker, it's W England, E N G L A N D F X at gmail.com. Or if you go to Facebook, he's got Walker, Texas trader as well. He's got a great group out there. He's got a calendar of all sorts of stuff. Uh, don't pigeonhole this guy into just trading Forex. What's your calendar look like? Wow, the, the calendar looks busy, Merlin. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, to say the least. But what I typically try to do is hold anywhere between oh, 10 to, to 12 webinars a month. And they range from strictly informational, what is a PIP, and they run all the way through advanced technical strategies. So there's really something for, for everybody out there. Yeah, I noticed. I, I, it's funny because I'll, I'll come up with an idea for the show and I'm like, hey, wait a minute. He just did a, he just did a webinar on that thing. I feel like I'm chasing you sometimes. What I'm going to do is I'm looking at whatever calendar you're going to do and I'm making sure I don't do those topics so I can you can copy me. <laughs> Hey, copy away. Uh, imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, so I'll, I'll take it. So they tell me. So they tell me. Um, all right, so we looked at the euro. Um, obviously, the Brexit deal has been a pretty big factor for the currency markets. Are there other things in the currency markets you like? Uh, maybe some of the Japanese yen, Aussie dollar, anything out there look nice, or is it kind of flat? Well, it's really just following headline news, and I, I really like the yen pairs heading north with the stock market as long as we see this positive trend in the S&P like we did today, big moves over a percent and a half on major indices, then I think you've got to like these yen pairs long. And whether it's going to be the pound yen, kiwi yen, cad yen, pick your vehicle. And for traders that are more longer term or looking for swing plays, that that could be a, a great play to look. Yeah, I'm bringing up a couple of them right now. You guys noticed that move up on the USD uh, JPY over the past mm-hmm. week has been phenomenal. Um, another question, this is from Kevin. He says, um, wondering about New Zealand strength right now compared to the other G6. So um, what about the, the Kiwi? I, I actually expect commodity currencies to outperform, and the Kiwi is right there, especially with the, the RBA coming in a little weaker Last night, I I think the Kiwi and the CAD are going to be competing for the number one commodity slot for the upcoming month. So yes, uh, if you're looking at something like a weak Euro, Euro Key is a a play that I'm interested in. Or even if you want to go Aussie versus Kiwi, commodity versus commodity, I, I think the daily breakout on the Aussie Kiwi today could be an interesting play in the upcoming weeks. You know, on that one, and I just brought up the the AUZ NZD for you guys. Um, that move of is just phenomenal, especially over the past couple of weeks. Uh, how often do you trade this one? This is a pair I don't trade. I haven't traded. I've just kind of I'm, I usually stick to U.S. based pairs. So tell me, give me some insights into the Aussie Kiwi. I I really like Aussie Kiwi for more passive trading, and believe it or not, it's not that you have to trade it often, but you find that they're so much fundamentally the same that if you just wait for key levels and then check the underlying fundamentals of the market, you can set a trade and just let it run for weeks or months at a time. And and that's the beauty of that currency pair. It's not a big mover. It's definitely the snail of the currency world, but you can find some phenomenal trends that really don't take uh, too much time away uh, as far as intensity and graphing to, to get a good position on. Yeah, then a pretty nice move. Uh, Brandon, who's one of our regulars up in Canada, he's saying uh, he's got to know about his Canadian dollar. He says, any hope for the CAD? He goes, Trudy pretty much uh, blanked the bed for us. Uh, we were a commodity currency until he sold our gold and shut down our oil industry. Um, USD CAD <laughs> is the one we're talking about. 
you know, while, while it's been selling off aggressively since the COVID peak back in March, you know, it's stabilizing now. I mean, nothing over the top for me. Sure. As far as the CAD's concerned, you do have to like the commodity ties and with oil pressing on 55 and 56 dollars a barrel you could definitely see a resurgence of the CAD and if I may I'll, I'll steal the screen again yeah. from you real quick anytime you want and you can start to see this nice massive downward trend line and we have just touched the uh, top trend line at 128.65 so the commodity correlation, if it holds strong, and if we do get the alternative weakness in the buck, I, I expect the CAD to, to outperform. Now, if the dollar does come on strong, this may just trend sideways for a while, but you, you've got to really respect the uh, massive downturn in play since last March. Yeah. Um, you know, in that situation where you had that USD CAD, I mean, this almost conflicts with my thoughts on it that we're going to see the dollar strengthen a rally. I mean, sure. You know, you use that 129.50 mark on the USD CAD, you know, that's kind of a line in the sand that to me achieves two things. If you get above 129.50, it gives you a little bit more confirmation that potentially this downtrend is over and you've broken above that downtrend line. So for those looking to go long, to me that's your, your major confirmer there would be if we get above that 129.5. <laughs> Yes, I, I like that as well. That would definitely be the, the higher high. That would be a new 2021 high. So yes, all bets are off, and, and that would definitely signify that the dollar is, is strong like bull at that point. <laughs> strong like bull, Totanka. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. What else do you want to talk about? There was some other... Oh, you know what? Crude oil would be a nice one. Um, it's great. Uh, it finally did what I thought it was going to do. It just took a lot longer than I anticipated. Uh, we, when we were looking at it down at ten bucks on crude oil and even negative forty, you know, it was that gap to me at forty eight was going to close, and it took a while to get there. We have officially closed that one, and now all of a sudden you're seeing new breakouts. Fifty five, oh three, where we're at today on the current CL contract. Great trend, nice breakout of this last two week sideways action. Um, what's your thoughts on where we could see crude oil head here? Oh, I love this trend. It, it just keeps on giving. And <laughs> it's one of those things, right? The, the sharper the drop, the bigger the rebound. And we'll probably never see a move like that again, like nope. we had on. <laughs> but uh, yes, the, this rebound, nice steady aggressively breaking new highs i think we challenge 65 by uh oh probably the the end of march or or april so i see another 10 points for for oil and again bringing it back to the cat I, I think it bodes well if we get that commodity correlation to, to come back but next big level for me 65 75 on this breakout yeah yeah, and I think it's pretty much smooth sailing too. You know, if you look above that, there's not too much to slow this down on that daily. You know, you've got a, couple, a little blip, yeah, right there. That's a little little hiccup in the road, but other than that, um, you know, it seems to be a pretty clean chart. Yes, it, it's hard to believe how far and how fast that oil just dropped off of the map because historically, over the last 15 years, we, we've been in this uh, 75 range. And really, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we even got up to this congestion from, from 2018 because going back the last decade and a half, that's about the median price that oil's been trading in. Yep. Yeah, and Ryan, you do bring up a good point. This is the, the chess match, which is trading, right? It says that will be bullish for the USD, though. Well, I mean, it could go either way. Remember, the oil's not just dependent on USD. We have a lot of other things that are going to impact it. But, you know, for me, one of the major pieces I see happening here that's going to impact oil further to the upside, uh, at least with regards to cost, is shutting down fracking. You know, going after these, these frackers, which are ruining our environment. And whether you believe that or not, it's not the topic of discussion. Bottom line is... Uh, you know, Republican Party was very friendly and open and repealing a lot of the regulations there. We know the Democratic Party is most likely going to come in and put more regulation and restrictions on fracking, thus increasing the cost and making it more difficult. So um, I think personally, from my perspective, the dollar isn't the major driver of this. It's going to be more of regulation at this point, certainly for a West Texas Intermediate. Um, the Brent might be a different price. but. Um, I think that's, the, for me, the major driver. And, of course, the dollar will play into it. And we'll see how the dollar impacts it if it continues to the upside. Yes, and don't forget the OPEC meeting tomorrow. 
guys, we've already had signals from OPEC that production output is going to be slowing into the 2021 year. They've finally gotten a grip on their production. It, it did take them uh, a few months to, to come around <laughs> with the uh, outliers and negative pricing. But I, I think that the trend continues now that they've got all gears turning and they, they finally have a, a bearing on where production will be in the upcoming six months to a year. All right. Let me see here real quick. Um, I think I let me see if I can send this out to the viewers. Let me know if you guys get this link. I'm posting a link in the chat right now to Walker's Facebook. I think that it, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> uh, I don't get why these ch chats sometimes work from, but just give me a thumbs up or something if that works. Uh, that will should be a a direct link to his Facebook group that's the Walker Texas Trader Group. And again, he puts a ton of effort and time and information in there for you, so I would encourage you guys to check that one out. Uh, I'm actually, you know what, I'll do this. Because I was going to ask you what your calendar is like and what you got cooking uh, on that calendar, but I can just bring the calendar up and we can talk about it. There it is right hey, there. Hey, sure. What's that? I said, sure, go ahead. Yeah, why not? Yeah. So this is what he's got cooking, his upcoming calendar. This is, uh, what are we on, the second? Oh, tra eh, Trader Merlin interview, whoop, whoop. He's got a strategy series that he's doing. I think that the green ones. Uh, oh no, you've got um, non-farm payroll event. Now you do certain. You do multiples, right? You do a subscription base. You do some webinars. And then you do some free ones. Um, you see, so you kind of got that, multiple stuff. That's right. There, there's something for for everybody. There, there's free events. There, there's paid events. It, it just depends on on what you're looking for. But. Uh, we will have the NFP coverage coming up on Friday. That's going to be a big one, like we said. So if you're interested in that, uh, just reach out to me on the Facebook group, and I'll, I'll make sure that we can get you into that webinar. Yeah, so if you guys are looking for content, whether it's free or paid, you know, Walker's got a lot of great stuff. I would encourage you to check that one out. Um, the, one of the other questions that keeps coming up here is that people are asking if you're still teaching for OTA. You're not teaching for OTA now, right? I'm still on the instructor pool. Okay. Uh, whether I, I, I have a class or not is TBD, but uh, <laughs> I, I still technically am an instructor, and I'm, I'm happy to teach at any center when I'm invited to. Yeah, Good. That's good to know. I, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not on the, the teaching side of it. Um, I know that the, the physical classes have been extremely limited, obviously, but yes. because, of, because of COVID. Um, and also, a lot of the shutdowns. So unfortunately, um, you know, some of these centers having to close their doors because of COVID, which is really unfortunate. But hopefully, uh, once things get back on their feet, these centers can open back up. And that means more traveling around for these instructors. So, um, And you teach just Forex, right? Uh, Forex and Core Strategy. Okay, mm -hmm. Forex and Core Strategy. Pepe was asking if you, t if you taught Futures. No, not not futures, uh, forex and corp. Mm -hmm. We do uh, talk about futures in the group, but but not for OTA. Cool. All right. Well, Walker. Hey, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I uh, look forward to having you back on again next month. I'm I'm hoping for you that that euro takes a little bit of a dive. I'll be I'll be keeping an eye on that one for you, my friend. Hey, thanks for having me, Merlin. It's always great, and we'll see you next month. All right. Sounds good. Take care. Right. Guys, that was Walker England. You can find him at Walker Texas Trader. I'm going to check my microphone levels because normally as soon as I switch this off, for some reason it sounds exponentially higher on my microphone. I'm hoping it doesn't sound so much higher for you guys. Uh, again, you can get him, find him at Facebook. I put the link in the chat there, but it's Walker Texas Trader is his group. Um, just some great stuff, great content out there. And, of course, you know it's always nice to spread the love of these guys who are uh, dedicated to helping people get better at their craft. All right, um, one of the things I want to do is get into some of the listener questions here. There's a whole bunch. Um, <laughs> Brendan, keep it PG-13. Uh, one of the things I want to do is get to a couple of listener questions, which I have not been able to get to over the past few days. I apologize. There's just so much going on. Um, here is a couple of them. Kevin says, with all the millions slash billions the hedge funds lost over the last couple of weeks due to their short positions, I can only assume that these people put in trades without the use of stop losses. Why is that? Because they're institutions. Remember, institutions have the ability to continue to uh, hold positions that are going against them because they can dollar cost average. They can buy more and buy more and buy more and buy more until they're blue in the face. And ultimately, they'll probably most likely pan out and make winning trades. For us, we can't, right? Most of us, if we continue to hold past stop losses, we'll get to the point where we are just insolvent and we blow our accounts, they margin call us and we're done. But hedge funds, big firms, they have relationships where they'll get the money. They'll get the money. So um, they're, use, they're not using stop losses. Some might be, right? I'm sure some uh, funds are using stop losses, but for the most part, they can just keep dollar cost averaging and scaling in. And I have to address this one today because it cracks me up. 
I am so sick and tired of hearing how the retail trader is now beating Wall Street. If you believe that, you are the greater fool. There's no freaking way a bunch of Robinhood traders who are limited to buying one share of GameStop are beating Goldman Sachs, who paid bonuses that are worth more than probably all the accounts combined of every Robinhood trader. There's no freaking way. What this is, is simply the transfer of wealth from people who don't know what they're doing to people who do know what they're doing. Now, I mentioned the other day, I said, you know, there's no way that uh, these major firms are going to be sitting there buying GameStop at $380, $400 per share. I told you I, I bought some puts on it, which were the most inflated put I've ever seen in my life. I actually closed it out. Uh, I closed my put today. I bought it back, closed it out, made a 35% profit on it. But it was frustrating because, you know, I bought puts. On, I bought the 180 put when it was trading at 355 and I closed it out today when GameStop was 95 bucks a share. You're thinking, man, he's, he's up $85 in the money on that put. Because the premium in Gamma was so high, it only ended up being a 35% rate of return. On any normal given day, that trade would have been probably a three, four, maybe 500% rate of return. If you shorted something with puts or bought puts on something at 350, and you're looking to cover it at 90, yeah, you made a killing, not with these ones. So they knew that this was gonna happen. The institutions um, are back in force shorting it. I can assure you, if we had a window into the, the financial statements of GameStop and Melvin, that they are heavily shorting, yet again, GameStop. And you're bringing in new people into the market to short GameStop too. Because if I'm Goldman Sachs or a hedge fund that's normally not even trading GameStop, I'm looking at that company going, its valuation is 20 bucks and it's now trading at $400. Short everything we can of that thing. Because there's no way these old Robin Hood guys are gonna bump it up to a thousand like Elon Musk said. So what this is a case is not David versus Goliath, right? It's this belief that we will beat the financial institutions as a whole. You will not, it will never happen. What happened is they got caught on one thing and you, these Robinhood traders, the Reddit group, Wall Street Bets, they exploited a small little thing. They stuck it to two or three, maybe five, 10 hedge funds out there got really smoked. But the grand scheme of things is why did Citadel put $2 billion back into Melvin Capital to short more of their market and continue their short operations knowing that these Robinhood traders make big mistakes? That's what happens out there. This is just, David versus ants. And right now those ants, or lemmings in this case, were leaping off the cliff saying, yay is us, we're so amazing, we beat Wall Street. No, you didn't do shit. You got lucky with one thing and now you're bragging about your GameStop shares. Enjoy those as they fall back down to 20. Drives me absolutely nuts. It's not David versus Goliath. Um, our jobs, for you and me, because there's no way I'm gonna beat Goldman Sachs. I'm not gonna be Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, nor do I aspire to. In Italy, my students gave me a name, and I know you guys heard this story, but I'm just gonna bring it up again. Uh, they call myself the Zenzari. They, they called me the Zenzari, which is Mosquito, and I thought it was always a very offensive, offensive name. And here's why I love it. You got, maybe I should just call myself Zenzari. This would be my new handle. Zenzari means mosquito in Italian, and the, the reason for it is I was telling them a story about how I, I had a mosquito. I didn't know I had a mosquito on my neck, but I went like this, and a mosquito flew off my neck. And it was so engrossed with blood, it could not fly. It literally dropped to the ground. It was like hopping, trying to get airborne off my desk. And I smashed it and it just, you know, big red spot on my desk. The point of it is that mosquito would have made it 100% survival rate if, if he just took a little blood and took off, right? For us, for you and me, for Jerry, Richard, Brendan, Larry, all you guys, our job is to be the mosquito. Get in there, get a little bit, and get out before the big guy squashes you. This is what's gonna happen with all these AMC and GME and space and all that stuff. These institutions are waiting for you to jack it up. And not only that, they're literally going in there and having people sit now in these Wall Street Bets rooms. If I'm Goldman Sachs, I'm gonna create a department within my company. And that department is doing nothing but sitting there with multiple monitors, and I want you to sit in on all these different chat rooms. Not only do I want you to sit in there and see what they're talking about trying to pump, and if they say, hey, hey we're, gonna, we're gonna take this stock up because it's heavily shorted, let the boss know. The boss will go to his trading floor, and let's say the Wall Street or Reddit chat room says this. Let's say they go, 
hey, we're going to take up uh, Microsoft today. Whatever. Right? It could be silver like it was yesterday. We're going to take up Microsoft today. I go and tell my boss, hey, they're pumping Microsoft. They're, that's the next one they're going to jump. I'll go straight to the trading desk and what do you think I'm going to tell my trading desk internally at my trading firm? Pull all your sell orders. Don't sell any Microsoft today. But but we have a target price of, you know, 200 bucks. I don't care. Sell it at 400. But it's not even close. Perfect because what I want to do is I want to let these one-hit wonders, Reddit chat rooms, day traders who are beating the system, they'll think they're moving the market. But they're not really moving the market because I'm just not selling anything. So they're trying to buy something that's not there. They have to pay a higher price. And then as soon as they get it at 400, I can now sell and crash the market. That's that's the way this system works. It, it boggles my mind hearing 20 year old telling me that they're beating the system. <laughs> You're not beating the system. You're going to get caught. Oh. Uh, Yes, that's true, Brendan. I was, I just pulled the name out of, out of the off the top of my head, but you know they did it with silver. And the funny part was, you know, Citadel, who now they're they're making out to be this evil demon. Citadel has the fifth largest position of silver in the world. You just made uh, Citadel a whole bunch of money. Now the thing that happened with silver today, I guess you guys saw it dropped about nine percent. Um, this is typical for pump and dump. This is typical of a short squeeze. It'll clear everybody out and then drop back down. But the institutions now are wise to it. Yeah, you got him on. It's like sucker punching Mike Tyson with one punch. You got it. You better make it a good one. And I, I think they did a number. They got a couple different, a um, uh, couple shots in to the hedge funds, to the industry. They, they made the industry aware on how this could be exploited. They've already adjusted. This will not happen again. Anyway, sorry, soapbox, soapbox time. It just drives me nuts when I hear the people that like think that they're just the greatest traders in the world because they made money on GameStop. You know, now all of a sudden they've got more followers than I do. It's crazy. All right, um, next question or comment is this one. <sighs> I just pisses me off, Drew. I'm not preaching. I just kind of it gets on my nerves when people think they're beating the system. You're not beating the system. <clears throat> you just have to learn to adapt to it. And this, the bigger money, hands down, is with the institutions. And as Josh says, but money always wins. It does. It does. And in the analogy I said where the guy punched Mike Tyson, they got the, the retail traders got away with one punch. You keep swinging like that, you think you're going to win against Mike Tyson? And I don't care how old your guys are. Mike Tyson will take any one of us out right now. <laughs> um, thoughts are, what are your thoughts on sundial growers? Well, Kevin, I'm not a big fan. Or Sorry, I am a big fan of the entire cannabis industry. I haven't cherry picked and looked down into the specifics of Sundial and their operations. What I am hearing is a lot of they are one of the major targets of these chat rooms, meaning Wall Street bets and Reddit users are saying this is the next one that they're going to jump to the moon. So you got to be real careful. Let's bring up the chart of SNDL. Uh, you got to be real careful when you look at ones like this because while they may be attractive, and I think you know this is to me be absolute risk capital, it hasn't mooned yet. It hasn't really spiked yet, which is good if you're thinking about holding this long term. But there's a lot of other stuff that you know can get pumped and dumped real quick. And especially when you're looking at a dollar a share, this is a prime target because most Reddit guys don't have a lot of um, a lot of capital. Let me go back to the daily here so we can see. So it, it has had a, a pretty di significant run. You know, 100% gain in, in five days is obviously phenomenal. So I'd be very careful in, in trading SNDL just because I know it's part of that pump list. If you do buy it, let's say you bought it a buck and next thing you know you're up at two, dump it. Take take some money off the table, right? Don't get greedy. Don't be that mosquito because I, I personally, I believe that every single person can make money in the financial markets if they act as a mosquito, meaning get in there, get just a little bit and then leave. Get enough to make you happy and to live the life you want and get out. But you get greedy like these guys that bought GameStop at 20 bucks and they didn't jump out at three or four or 500. They're idiots, right? They will ultimately lose every single thing that they have because they got greedy and Goliath will squash them. Trust me. All right, what else do I got? Um, so uh, to the Sundial question, you know, I don't know specifics about it. There's other users in, or other participants in this room that probably know more about Sundial growers than I do. Overall, I am very bullish on the segment. I actually think that the whole cannabis industry is on the verge of having its second blow up, meaning blow up to the upside. And that will come, my my hope is, in the next year or two, when we hear the federal government say that they're going to legalize on a federal level cannabis 
and uh, THC, CBD, those types of things, legal on a federal level. Once that happens, this will be absolutely skyrocketing industry. And I still think that evaluations today, uh, that overall it's probably fairly undervalued. All right, what else do I got? There were a bunch of comments that come on through, so sorry if I missed it. Sucker punching Mike Tyson might be the best metaphor. <laughs> because you know you're going to get killed, right? I mean, if Mike Tyson, even at, well, how old is he now, 55? I don't know if you saw that last fight. He was destroying Roy Jones. He was, I mean, Roy Jones was like, could we please end this fight? This is painful stuff. Well, he's an old man. Well, he will whoop some butt. Um, I know people who have never bought a stock in their lives and made a 100 bucks on a share of GM. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's it, Simon. And it, it, I just want to turn to him and say, shut up. Right, just just shut up. You got lucky, man. You got real lucky, and it is it's not uh, it's not gonna get there. I'm beating your ears. Sorry, sorry, Richard. I know the microphone got a little bit hot. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. yes, uh, and the news says they have more than ten thousand people watching those channels and buying GME. Yes, and that's that's the herd mentality. That's collusion. Essentially, is when you have a big group of people all working together and you're pushing them all in one direction. That's fine to me. If you have 10,000 people that each have an account balance of $1,000, that still doesn't make for a ton of money, does it? Right? That's that's what, $10 million? $10 million is a, it's in the kitty at Goldman Sachs. I mean, that's that's their lunch fund. I mean, it, the, the amount of money that people think that these Robin Hood traders are throwing around, it's not that significant. What makes it significant is that all of a sudden they work together at the same time. And again, if, if I see that situation and I'm an institution and I know they're going after a company, all I have to do is not sell anything. Because remember, market makers by name have to make a market. They have to have a buy order and they have to have a sell order. If you, if you look at their operations, it doesn't mean their sell orders have to be competitive. So let's say right now on stock XYZ, which is the chat room talk and they're all saying in Reddit, we're gonna, we're gonna take up stock XYZ. Right now, the, the ask price, the price that you can um, buy it at right now, let's say is, is 10 bucks. As a market maker, I don't have to sell at 10 bucks. I can put an offer to sell at 20 or 50 or 80 or $5,000 per share. As long as I have a quoted price in the market, I fit my fiduciary obligation as a market maker and I can just sit out there. So if I know that the groups are gonna pump up stocks X, Y, Z, I just lift all my offers, meaning I lift all my sell orders. Instead of selling at 10 bucks, I'll sell it at 40. And what happens is if you get collectively, enough institutions do that, then those retail guys, those 10,000 guys that you're talking about, when they jump in and push it up, they're not really doing much other than buying fewer shares that are available, if that makes sense. Because let's say right now at 10 bucks there, there is a million shares available at the ask price. That's what you could buy. But as soon as we get this news as institutions, we say, you know what, cancel all orders, and now there's only 100 shares available to buy. So when those market participants on Reddit try to buy, there's nothing there for them to buy. They have to pay a higher price. They're paying 11 bucks, 12 bucks, 13, and it moves up parabolic, all because the big institutions who are selling the shares just backed away. It's, it's a simple market mechanism um, reason for this to happen. All right, um, let's see. Yes, fundamentals wise, I agree with Brendan. It's a very interesting one. I mean, it, it's difficult because you look at some of the numbers um, and they don't make sense, right? You look at some of the valuations, like these guys aren't making any money. The other part of it here is a large portion of the cannabis industry is still black market. Um, I know several participants in the cannabis space and they're telling me, you know, well, we're kind of legal. I'm like, oh God, don't, don't tell me that. I don't want to know that stuff. It, it's still not there, but as soon as that that switch is clicked on federal legal, they'll go full legit, and all of a sudden they're they're <laughs> they're uh, making tons of money on this. So um, there are key players out there, depending on which market segment. Uh, I do have some shares of companies in the cannabis space. I think the easiest entrance is going to be in a company or in an ETF like MJ will probably be the easiest way to get in there. Um, Larry sent me this as my last question here, and then I'll, I'll wrap up the show. Uh, yeah, Dave, uh, don't buy GameStop. You know, buy GameStop at 20. I think that if GameStop does the right thing, they could bump their valuation up and, and last a couple more years because of this. But basically, this just really made GameStop execs rich. If I'm a GameStop exec, I'm hoping I sold out at 300 bucks a share because you know there's no way that that thing is worth a $400 valuation. So uh, what 
do you teach OTA in Cal? Do I teach at OTA in California? If so, what asset classes? I don't do physical classes anymore. I'm basically the guy behind the scenes building all the content. So when you see the on-demand courses, I work with all the instructors and build out all the visuals and build the content there. Um, physical classes? No, I don't don't teach them anymore. I, I miss it. I really do love the physical classes, but um, no, I don't teach them. I just taught course strategy. The more classes you teach, the less time you actually get to trade, which is kind of a drain on me. So. Um, how does a person become a market maker? Uh, you have to be a registered market participant. So usually it's on behalf of a trading firm. So if you had a financial firm like XYZ Trading and you were a registered securities broker, you could get a market maker ID. It's called an MPID, market maker participant ID. And then you'd be able to be buying and selling and, and providing liquidity to the market. But to be honest, you, you wouldn't want to do that. There's no need for that anymore. You can use electronic networks and do everything that a market maker can do. Um, in the late 90s, market makers were making a killing off of the spreads. That's just what they did. So it was very cool to have those things. No longer that critical to be a market participant ID. All right, let me check out your economic calendar and earnings calendar for today. Um, here is what we have cooking for today. And, and I, I tweeted out just a minute or a little while ago on how crazy the volatility was because this is without a doubt your popcorn. I, I just have to use the gratuitous graphics. This is your uh, popcorn trades of the day. If you look at what happened to Amazon right as they came out with earnings, it was pretty crazy. For the day, you had Amazon, Alibaba, Google, ExxonMobil, BP, Pfizer, and Google reporting earnings just for fun. As some of you may not have access to 24 hour information, I'll check out Amazon here and we'll go five minutes. And no, there was, I think, Kevin, you asked earlier. Did I comment on Bezos stepping down as the CEO? No, didn't really. Um, I don't think that that's going to be too much of an impact. He's still going to remain the chairman of the board. So no big deal there, I don't believe. I, I think that this is a machine that I don't think that it needs Bezos anymore. I, I, I know that sounds weird. I don't think it needs Bezos anymore. This is a machine that's pretty much set. It just needs to keep on rolling and grow a little bit. But I mean, it's dominating in so many areas, just as long as that CEO can keep all of those pieces moving to the best of their ability. The visionary part of it, I, I think, is no longer needed. And I think that that's what Bezos brought to it. That's my two cents on it. I don't think this is uh, that big of a deal like it was with Google a couple years back. I think that was maybe a bit more of an issue. All right, um, so here's your Amazon. Look at the swing. It went from, it was trading at, uh, 3384 it dropped to a low of 3251 so you're talking um, 130 point drop there and then it rallied to a high of 340 3431 so you're looking at a 180 point swing in five minutes on Amazon right now it's up in the after hour session by, to the tune of about two percent Google here's Google on the other hand uh, doing very well their numbers were phenomenal I mean they beat pretty much all across the board and huge uh, huge beats they jumped from let me go uh, 1927 and it's currently trading at 2177 so you're looking at $150 move up in each share of Google which is the tune of almost 10% nice moves up there uh, what else do I have question from if you are an authori authorized trader for someone else's account would you be considered a professional yes you would um, I believe you have to, well, you can do it with a, I believe you have to have a, a license to be trading someone else's money. So technically that would make you a professional. So yes. Um, I know that I heard of some guy that years ago on the floor, he just had a, what's it called? A power of attorney to trade someone else's account. But I don't think that that, that holds up legally. You need to have someone who's, I believe you have to have someone who is uh, a quote unquote professional to trade someone else's money, hence the licenses. And, and bottom line is you, you should have if you ever think about having somebody trade your money, make sure that they are a licensed broker. And the easy way to do that is just go to FINRA. You can go to FINRA and you can actually type, I think they have a search uh, a broker thing. <laughs> Wendy, I haven't seen Wendy in a long time. Hope you're doing well, Wendy. Um, if you go to FINRA, you can type, there's a broker search. And if you if you ever have anybody say, hey, I'll, I'll trade your money for you, search for them on there. If they're, if they're not a FINRA registered advisor, then ignore them. They're, there's no protection there and they might steal your money. I mean, there's a lot of shady people out there, uh, which is why I don't manage anybody's money because I'm not FINRA registered, so don't ask me. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, let me go. I got a couple more things. We looked at the earnings calendar for today. Um, the economic calendar for today wasn't anything special. Here's what's cooking for tomorrow. You got a, a lot of pretty good announcements with regards to earnings tomorrow. AbV, Qualcomm, PayPal. Uh, you have Align Technologies, GlaxoSmithKline, Boston Scientific, Spotify, eBay, Grubhub for their first, I believe their first earnings since going public. Biogen, Spirit Airlines, and MetLife all reporting earnings 
tomorrow. It should be an exciting one. On the economic front, you do have a couple things going out. Usually, um, non-farm payrolls will be the issue for tomorrow. And then you have final services, PMI, crude oil inventories. That's the major stuff coming out for the U.S., and other than that, not a ton of really critical stuff. You have a bunch of manufacturing and services info coming out for European Union and for the British pound. Okay. Um, Larry says, even for a friend or family trading their account. Um, you know, that's a tricky one, Larry. I, I would be very careful with that. I've learned firsthand, well, not firsthand because I haven't really ruined it for anybody, but by watching other people trade family money, I would highly advise you against it. I, I just because when you're making money, things are great, but when you start to lose, which is going to happen, you're going to have a losing streak. You'll have a period where you lose money, no big deal. When that happens, then there's tension, there's animosity there. I, I really would not recommend trading your family's money. Uh, I, I will trade only my own money. I think that's the, the safest way to go. It prevents a lot of problems out there. All right, what's tomorrow? Tomorrow's Wednesday. I do not believe I have a guest on tomorrow's show, so I will make up something tonight or tomorrow or whatever you guys decide to, to tell me. If you go and email me, tradingrowing at gmail.com, I know we have a couple questions I still need to get to. If you send me questions, something you want me to cover on tomorrow's show, let me know. I'll be happy to do that. You can send them in at tradingrowing at gmail.com. That's the easy way to do it. Until then, happy trading, everybody. Hope you enjoyed today's show with Walker Anglin. If you're new to the program, hit subscribe. If you're not, give me a thumbs up. If you don't like it, email me and tell me why. Until then, happy trading, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow.